If you're into solitude, Earth 2020 is not the place to be. There are now nearly 7.7 billion people on this planet. By 2030, it is projected that there will be 8.6 billion of us and nearly 10 billion by 2050. Consider this. It took humanity 200,000 years to reach a population of 1 billion. Yet, it has taken just another 200 years to surpass 7 billion. Explosive growth would not be an inappropriate descriptor. To compound the challenge, the vast majority of humanity is in hot pursuit of a common goal, the pursuit of accumulating more stuff. Indeed, opponents of economic growth are often viewed with suspicion. In applying traditional economic theory, there is no road to success other than progressive growth. More people making more things enhances wealth, and this allows more people to buy more things. This virtuous circle of economic growth has been a recipe for success for over 200 years. Yet all good things must eventually come to an end. In an empty world with abundant source resources, the paradigm of more people making more things served humanity well. Unearth resources, make stuff, reinvest, keep pedaling, train load after train load, truck after truck. The environmental resources have continued to flow, making many rich in the process. But in a full world of finite resources, this model is more than just ineffective. It's downright dangerous. 7.7 .7 billion people consuming resources in an unfettered manner has produced pollution and negative consequences at grand scale. Mass extinctions of flora and fauna, rivers that would be dangerous to swim in, let alone drink from, the global collapse of fisheries, widespread deforestation, and of course the granddaddy of all ecological threats, climate change, all signal that we humans have lost the plot. We are drawing down an ecological stock that is irreplaceable. Even those who have hardened themselves to ignore these evident environmental perils cannot ignore the economic fallout from unsustainable resource usage. As more people consume more of our finite resources, the economic law of scarcity emerges as a harbinger of future misery. Amplified competition for a finite base of resources pushes prices higher. And today we see evidence of this happening everywhere. Consequently, resource dependent firms are seeing profits and competitive advantage evaporate. This is where the circular economy enters the picture. The circular economy begins with the simple premise. Waste is a physical sign of suboptimal resource use. Each pile of trash, each bin of construction waste, each bag of garden clippings all represent money being tossed away. Circular economy theory seeks to optimize resource usage, and there are some clear strategies to do so. Make no mistake though, the circular economy is not a panacea to unsustainability, but it is a step toward a more sustainable economy that politicians, business leaders, and consumers in general can embrace because optimizing the productivity of resources reduces the cost of waste management, is profitable for businesses, and helps consumers stretch their household budgets. Let's look at the foundations of this. Because the circular economy is, at its core, a strategy for optimizing resource productivity, it is inherently connected to key principles of waste management practice. Those who work in waste management speak of a hierarchy when it comes to handling waste. Simply put, some waste management strategies are preferred over others. One way to describe this hierarchy is through the eight R's. The eight R's are resource management strategies that include, in order of preference, first, refusing or reducing resources. Second, re reusing resources when possible. Then repairing, remanufacturing or rehoming materials for other uses when re reuse is not possible. 
recycling what is left over when possible, and when not possible, recovering all residual resources, including energy, from a given waste material before sending the rest to the landfill. Circular economy theory embraces this waste hierarchy and attempts to incorporate it into a mapping of the economy where producers and consumers seek to make better use of resources. This system looks like this. Here we find a resource pool, the stuff we make things from. Into the top of this resource pool, we have a flow of virgin resources. We want to try to avoid virgin resource usage because they are either from finite stocks or from renewable resources that require land and other resources to support. Therefore, the first priority in optimizing resource usage is to avoid or reduce virgin resources coming into the economic system. Now, under the resource pool in the diagram, we find two pyramids labeled producers and consumers. These are the two actor groups of our economic system. People who make things and people who consume things. The two pyramids suggest that the waste management hierarchy has a role to play in our circular economy vision. Some waste management activities are more important than others. Note, the terms refuse and reduce appear above the pyramids and not in the pyramids. This highlights an important point. In both production and consumption activities, minimizing resource usage is the highest form of resource productivity. Makes sense, don't you think? If you do anything with less material, there are no costs, only gains. So these two activities, refusal and reduction, are the golden goals of the circular economy. They always come first. Looking at the left side of the schematic, where the producer pyramid is, we see our pyramid de depicted with reuse at the top and residual material recovery at the bottom. This conveys a key principle of the circular e economy. Generally speaking, some activities are more impactful than others. Business strategies to re reuse resources generally yield enhanced profitability because reusing resources does not require costly product modifications. Buff it up and sell it, goes the motto. Similarly, one step down the rung, strategies built around repairing resources can be highly profitable because, aside from minor parts and labor costs, the bulk of the resources can be used again. Replace the wires, buff it up, and resell it. A new motto. Yet another step down the rung, a strategy built around remanufacturing products can be profitable because the remanufacturing process allows existing component parts to be upgraded into higher value added products. This is a repair strategy at a higher level of sophistication. The remanufacturing motto goes, put in a new motherboard, buff it up and resell it. A rehoming strategy essentially refers to strategies where the materials recovered from a waste resource are simply retasked for other purposes. For example, the gypsum from, an artif from a coal-fired power plant might go to a company that makes gyprock wallboard. Although this might not result in the same value-added output as a remanufacturing strategy, it does permit an organization to turn a waste cost into a revenue stream. Can't use it for yourself? Find someone who can use it and sell it to them. That's the motto of the rehoming strategy. Recycling is typically a step down the rung from a rehoming strategy because recycling something does not often result in high revenue. It is usually done as a public service or to offset waste disposal costs. Can't use it yourself? Find someone who can use it and give it to them. Finally, the reason why a residual market recovery strategy is found at the bottom of the producer pyramid is that the recovery of residual materials from waste resources usually requires extractive technologies and as a result, these strategies rarely yield revenue for producers. For example, 
Before sending organic waste to compost, there are valuable minerals, acids, and other chemical elements that can be extracted. Although the hierarchy suggests that some activities are more valuable than others, this should not be misconstrued to suggest that activities that are lower on the hierarchy are never more attractive than higher order activities. There are not absolutes, only rules of thumb. Turning to the consumer pyramid to the right, we see a similar pattern. For consumers, the greatest savings are to be had by reducing usage. Failing that, reusing something is often more preferable. For example, if you have a jar of pickles and can rinse it out after use and use it as a container for other things, the only cost to the consumer is the cost of washing out the jar. Similarly, Repairing might be an attractive strategy because typically repairing something requires only labor and minor parts. Remanufacturing and rehoming a, a product that a consumer no longer needs usually involves transferring a product back to the producer for free. So these strategies to the consumer are less preferable to reuse and repair. Another step down the rung, recycling and material recovery at the consumer level usually means sending waste products to a recycler with or without paying a disposal cost. It is seldom that consumers can recoup funds from selling waste to a recycler. Aside from the importance of the waste hierarchy for guiding pr producer and consumer activities in the circular economy, there are a number of smaller loops on top of the producer and consumer pyramids worth mentioning. On the producer side, for example, there are loops associated with reuse, repair, rehome, and remanufacturing. This means that products can be either cycled internally in a closed loop process or transferred to other businesses for feeding into their processes. On the consumer side, there are loops associated with reuse and repair, suggesting that products are either reused or repaired within the same home or given to other consumers for reusing or repairing. Finally, there is a flow of materials indicated on this diagram that runs from consumers to producers in regard to reuse, repair, rehoming, and remanufacturing activities. This suggests that further economic opportunities are available to companies that strive to retrieve used resources from consumers. Design for disassembly strategies and product buyback programs fall into this realm. In conclusion, the circular economy is a complex dynamic system where some stakeholders are actively striving to receive the most economic value from their waste flows. Meanwhile, other stakeholders are actively striving to purchase waste materials in various forms at the lowest economic price. Amidst all this, producers and consumers alike are constantly seeking to upvalue their resources by turning waste resources into higher value commodities and goods. The circular economy represents resource optimization at grand scale and scope. For countries, it engenders enhanced productivity and innovation, generating more taxes and employment. For companies, it engenders innovation and creativity, reducing costs and diversifying product lines. For consumers, it helps households reduce costs and stretch family budgets. The circular economy is frugality made cool. The circular economy represents balance and enhanced sustainability. As such, it is far more than just a strategic wave of the future. It's the only way we'll stave off ecological collapse as we learn to play more benevolent roles in our planetary ecosystem.